Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Nomad World weekly series. I'm Becky, and once again, I'm going to be your host. And today, we're going to be talking about returning to your roots as a digital nomad with my guest, Milan Milutinovich. Milan, welcome to the show. How you doing, Becca? You did well in the last name. Congratulations, Milutinovich. Very well pronounced. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We're going to find out in just a moment where that name comes from. Because we're going to talk about you returning to your roots. I love the story that you shared with me, and I'm excited for you to share it with our listeners. So can okay. you first start out by telling us about your background and where you are now and how you got there? Yeah, sure, sure. So I am I grew up in Australia, in uh, Melbourne, actually, Melbourne. <laughs> I've been losing my Australian accent the more I've been traveling and living out of the country for a few years now. I grew up in Melbourne to um uh, to Serbian parents. So both of my parents are from a little city in Serbia called Niš. And uh, I so we grew up at home always speaking Serbian. And uh, my mom didn't know English, actually, when she first came to Australia. So we very much had that classic immigrant upbringing at home. We spoke Serbian. The outside world was English. And so for that reason, I always held this language. And um, <clears throat> should I just keep going? You want to hear the whole life story? Should I just? Yeah, just please keep, keep going. Yeah. So we grew up in Melbourne. Uh, I was born in 1992. So my parents actually left Serbia. At that time, it was Yugoslavia still. So Yugoslavia today is Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Slovenia. So six countries today were once united in uh, a country called Yugoslavia. Yugo in Serbian means the South, so it's the Southern Slavic Republic or something like that. So that was a country when they were growing up and they grew up in a city called Niš. And um, my dad decided to leave um, Yugoslavia at the time to go on an adventure in Australia and to uh, try and earn some money. Australia was, you know, a, a successful economy, a, a rich country and far away and full of adventure and stuff. So my dad decided to go and he wanted to go initially, I think just for one year. And um, uh, my mom ended up following him a few months later. And uh, unfortunately, after about a year of being there, the war broke out in Yugoslavia and all of these countries that we have today began to form and they <laughs> the whole thing broke apart so they ended up staying in Australia um kind of indefinitely just there's like why would you go back during a war I guess it's pretty natural you're in Australia it's an amazing country and so we spent our whole life in Australia more or less and I grew up very much Australian feeling like an Australian but I always had this identity of feeling Serbian or you know, being tied to the Balkans in some sense, but it, it's so far away um, from Australia. So it wasn't, you know, we, you know, I basically Australianized completely. But um, when I was in Australia, I was a professional musician. That was my first career. I was a, a blues singer, a singer songwriter. Uh, you can see these guitars behind me. So music's a big part of my life. And uh, that's when I, I came to love traveling. You know, we would go on tour as a band and I just love going to different towns, and meeting people and playing shows and stuff. And uh, once I kind of, <clears throat> once Corona hit, I kind of, you know, my whole music career kind of ended. But um, I'd been doing a bit of software developing on the side. I was just designing and building websites for people. And then I slowly got more and more into that. And I found a remote job. And I started traveling uh, during Corona around Australia, trying to escape lockdowns and such. <laughs> and um, I kind of just continued that journey. And I thought, you know, if I'm working remotely, I can I can actually live in Serbia. And uh, that's how I ended up at, at the beginning of my nomad journey. I thought, let me check out Serbia. And I kind of got stuck here. I mean, I travel a lot, but um, yeah. So if I understand it right, was the first time you went to Serbia after the pandemic or had you been with the family before no, had as, you visited? As, as, as kids, we went a few times. 
um never for a long period the most in my whole life until i was 30 more or less i'd spent maybe two months in total in serbia so it was it was it very much felt like a foreign country to me when i first moved here i was like well, what is this where am i this is quite a big change from australia of course yeah what were your first impressions when you i'd say could register what serbia was like because i don't know how young yeah. you were when you first went when I was a kid, I mean, I always felt connected. I always felt like this is where we're from. My dad always told me to be, you know, you're a Serbian, never forget where you're from and all this stuff. So I always held held to that. But it it's so far away. You know, it's a completely different side of the world. My parents kind of lost touch through the years with Serbia. They kind of, you know, we just Australianized. We integrate into Australian society. And we kind of lose that part of the the heritage and I mean, less and less was, were we even speaking Serbian to each other. It was only really with my parents that I spoke Serbian. And before I decided to to move here and and, and do this digital nomad journey, um, my, I remember with my dad, I was talking just in English. And I was like, hang on, we got I need to practice. I need to get back into uh, you start getting back to Serbia. I'm going to be using this language a lot. <laughs> and, uh, so I felt that we were I, I, I was in I, I was possibly going to lose this part of my of my culture and you know when I have kids and I get married and everything maybe maybe they won't feel as connected to Serbia and I just thought there's something there's something there that maybe I should explore before we 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 let leave it by the wayside you know yeah no I think it's incredible that you went back and when you went back to live this time for a longer period did you go yeah. to the your hometown or where your parents are from, which is called, you said it's called yeah. Niche. Niche, yeah, yeah. I uh, I remember I arrived first in Belgrade uh, because, you know, international flights will come through to Belgrade, be coming from Australia. And I remember getting off the plane and I had, you know, like 200 Australian dollars and I needed to exchange it for... Um, for some local currency and I remember just feeling so shy <laughs> and I'm like I, I can't talk to the woman in Serbia like I just can't do it you know it's just I had this huge mental block and we're walking around trying to get the courage to speak to a stranger in Serbia because I realized like I haven't actually done this like I've never actually spoken to a stranger in this language that I'm more or less fluent in which is kind of amazing um so I stayed in Belgrade but I I, I decided I never thought that I would move to Niche uh, because my parents always told me, you know, they left, they left it in when they left, you know, it was during the war and everything. There was this, there's this perception that there are no opportunities in niche, especially compared to Australia, you know, the lucky country and everything. And uh, I thought, well, I'll come down, I'll check it out. You know, we have some family here. And I remember when I came to niche, uh, my auntie gave me the keys to this house that I'm sitting in right now. She said, uh, this house is yours. You know, this, this, this house has been abandoned more or less. No one's been living in it for a few years and uh, there weren't guitars hung up there. There was nothing. It was kind of <laughs> a bit run down. There were cobwebs everywhere. And I just thought, um, wow, I actually have a whole house in this city. And um, that's kind of amazing. And uh, in fact, this house, my, my dad grew up in this house, but my grandpa actually built this house you know, in, in the 60s. So this house has been in our family for a very long time. And when my dad moved to Australia, to, he, he went more or less to, to earn some money, you know, to have an adventure and have a good time, of course, but to earn some money to send back to build this house. In Serbia, a lot of families, they'll have kind of, you know, the first generation will live on the bottom floor and then they'll save up money and then they'll add another kind of, what do you call it, another floor to the house, and then the other generation will live up there. So that was kind of the idea that, you know, grandpa would live downstairs. My dad would live upstairs with me and his wife and, you know, my mom and everything. And um, then when I got here and this house was abandoned, I just thought this was part of this mission for why we went to Australia, why I'm even Australian. It's kind of tied to this house and it just kind of really touched me. And I just felt so connected to this house. I just thought, you know, it's been in our family. It's been such a big part of my life, even though I never lived here. I barely even visited this house when we were kids. We maybe went here once or twice, a few times, you know, at most. And I just thought, what an incredible story. What if I continue this 
lineage and it's now it's three generations we're building this house so i decided to renovate it to get rid of all the cobwebs and everything and uh, that was a hell of a journey in and of itself hiring tradesmen in a foreign country i've never re i've never renovated a house before so that was an adventure there was uh you know that that had its own uh own story too wow and how big is this house that you're in now that your grandpa built well it's two stories and then there's an attic up top as well there is a garage that i'm slowly converting into being some kind of a recording studio I have a podcast as well, just like you. We're all podcasters here. <laughs> and uh, there's, in fact, there's a bunker as well. So a lot of houses in Serbia have bunkers during wartime. So the, you know, there was the, the raids and the sirens and everything. And people would need to get out of the house and, and go somewhere for shelter. So just underneath the house, there is a bunker, which uh, I want to convert to be like a jacuzzi, a spa room or something. I think what an incredible transformation that would be. Um, for this space you know yeah that's incredible and and you didn't know did you did you know you had this house and before you arrived in niche yeah yeah we had this house but like my parents they kind of it was almost like to the side it was kind of forgotten about you know and real estate in Serbia the value of real estate is much lower than in Australia so this house I think was worth around seventy thousand dollars or something like that um, before I started renovating. So they didn't see it as something, they kind of saw it as more of a nuisance. Like we have this old abandoned house, you know, what do we do with this? Should we just sell it? There's no way Milan's going to actually renovate it. You know, there's no way anyone in our family is going to use this house or whatever. Um, but the story changed. Uh, but that's a very common story in Serbia. And a lot of, a lot of the Balkans, really, a lot of people leave, seeking greater economic opportunities they go to australia they go to america they go to you know england or something all the rich countries let's say to seek economic opportunities and they have all of this real estate that kind of lays abandoned um it's 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 not an uncommon story you know in fact i have another house that i'm also <laughs> in line to inherit in in a in a little town about half an hour away from here so i'm like a just walked into this country and became a, a landlord. <laughs> just a mogul now. Got two properties. Wow. Now. <laughs> that is quite a story. So I yeah. am curious about the town of Niche. You moved in, you you already had a place to live. What's yeah. the town of Niche like? How did you start to feel about it as you got to know it better? A little niche, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's uh it's a very different change to Australia. I mean, I felt very much like a fish out of water. There aren't too many kind of internationals that live here. There aren't even too many. Sir, so I thought when I moved here, oh, there'll be some other Ameri some American Serbian, some Canadian Serbian will will just be here, and they like had the same idea, like, yeah, we're gonna go back, and you know, we're gonna start a new life in Serbia. Like, why not after the pandemic, check out our roots or something? You know, I thought there'd be people that wanted to have a big change in their lives as well but uh, i kind of realized no i'm out here on my own on my lonesome and uh i thought okay i i gotta integrate there's no easy there's no english speaking community here for me to just tap into of like expats or something it's like okay i gotta i gotta find my people here took some time you know it is difficult when you when it is your second language when you don't feel comfortable speaking a language you kind of, I've realized this, that, um, and I've speak to a lot of people here in Niche that live here that, you know, English for them is their second language and they'll speak very good English, but they feel a bit insecure about it or they feel that they can't express themselves fully, you know, and I remember feeling that way completely. I was like, I'm not as funny anymore. I'm not as confident anymore because I'm using this language that I'm, and I'm in a country I'm not so, you know, I, I feel like a foreigner in this country, you know what I mean? Uh, so it took me time to find my feet, but I've realized uh, there's a lot of amazing people here. You know, I feel like I have such a strong community here um, that that I just feel very connected to. Um, and yeah, I kind of feel like I have all these great nomad friends and I have these great people here. And that's why I decided to put on this conference and kind of let's mix the two people together and let's just see see what happens, you know, let's bring some knowledge, share some stories to each other and uh, let's have a great big party, you know.
Okay. So you're going to have a conference in niche. You're inviting yeah. nomads in and it, this is going to be August 9th through the 12th. Is that right? August 9th to 12th, the niche nomad weekend. It's our first time running this conference. I've never run a conference before. My uh, business partner, Zoran, has run conferences before, and we have a great organizer, Anna, who's helping out with everything. And um, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the what I've realized as well in this city, and especially in this region, digital nomads can actually bring a lot of value to the Balkans. The way I look at it is there's a lot of brain drain. A lot of young people feel like there aren't as many economic opportunities here. They feel like they have to go to Germany, America, Australia, whatever, to build the life they want to live. And so it's quite interesting to bring people from all of those countries to come here and to share their knowledge and their experiences. And it's kind of a brain gain fighting that brain drain. I feel like if you bring digital nomads in, you know, a lot of knowledge gets shared, they invest in the community, they might create some jobs, you know, and more than anything, they share their ideas, you know, people connect. That's, that's the most beautiful thing I think about digital nomads. They're open-minded people and, and we share, you know? Oh yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to picture niche. So I haven't shared with you, but I went to Serbia for the first time at the beginning of May. So just a couple of months oh. ago, only oh, to cool. Belgrade. Uh, and okay. I really loved it. I went to actually four different countries in the Balkans. I'd never been to the oh, Balkans cool. before. And I can tell oh. people listening, it's a fascinating region. So much interesting history. A lot yeah. of pain that is, you know, still being processed and rebuilt. And, you know, everybody's building back from that, I think now. But it's fascinating. It's a it's a very different culture and very different feel yeah. from even Western Europe. So, oh, for sure. I, I'm curious if you were to bring me in for this niche nomad weekend, what kind of mm -hmm. things am I going to see in niche? What kind of activities do you have planned? What is there to well, do in niche for the nomads coming in? Nomads, what are we going to do? We're going to have a great time, first of all. That that I could promise you. <laughs> we uh, Well, we have support from uh, Visit Niche, which is the Board of Tourism here in the city they're very excited about digital nomads they think it's amazing they're very excited to meet these people i've, I've told them a good story about what kind of people these nomads are and uh, so they'll be hosting a welcome party for people on the 9th of august uh this whole event is free by the way we're, we're just deciding to give for the first year and just we just want to share and, and create something amazing you know we're not asking for money so it's just going to be a totally free event to integrate people. So there's the welcome party uh, on the 9th of August, organized by the Board of Tourism, where there'll be some food, some drinks. They're going to hire a band that'll play like some traditional Serbian music. We'll get the dancing going. We'll show them how you party in Serbia to the traditional folk music, which is kind of really cool. What I love about Serbia, it's a very traditional kind of society. So like, Serbian traditional music is still very much part of the culture. It doesn't feel like something that your grandma would listen to. It's like you still, you know, go to go to the club and they're playing that music and you're dancing and you know they're playing their accordion, all these instruments that, you know, are quite foreign if you're coming from America or Australia. But it's still the party. That's just the party music that we have. So it's kind of really cool. And um, so they'll be hiring a band. So we'll have a great night dancing. And then on the 10th and the 11th of August, during the day, we have talks from um, a lot of great entrepreneurs and digital nomads that I've connected with through the years. And we also have some entrepreneurs here from Niche talking about their business and what they've built. So I kind of really want to connect the two communities. Um, and then at night, we're connecting with the local co-workings in Niche with uh, Think Innovative Hub and uh, the Delhi co-working. They're going to be helping us post some things so that when the nomads come, they know which co-workings to go to, they know who to hang out with. And then on the 12th of August, we have a day of tourism, which I think we're going to go to wine yard or something. There's still, there's so much moving and changing as this as this plan evolves and more people keep signing up. So we, <laughs> we're going to see exactly what we're going to do. But uh, I think likely we're going to be going to a winery or something like that and just having a nice day. Um, but yeah, the Board of Tourism is very, very excited 
And I kind of feel like the nomads can look at it. They're almost personal guests to the city. Like it, it really is going to be an incredible integration event. That sounds fantastic. I'm wondering also about accommodation. Is there a lot of accommodation available in Niche? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, Niche is a city of about 300 to 400,000 people, depending on who you ask, you get different numbers. But so it's it's kind of, it's not that small of a city, you know, 300, 400,000 people, there's quite a few things going on. Uh, we have one of our hotel partners is Hotel Tami, who we are going to be, I think even throwing a pool party with them or something. I shouldn't be saying all this on air, but I'm, I'm just speaking openly about what, as things are being planned. But I think likely that's going to happen. Um, so there is accommodation. We're going to have a list of hotels and everything that we're going to um, point people towards. We'll have a guide and everything of what to do. But um, things are still in development. Things are still developing as we go. Great. What about food? Because I'm going to tell you, when I went to Serbia, I left still not knowing what I'm supposed to be eating or if there oh, were really? like great dishes that I missed. Didn't oh, do a lot really? of Googling before I went, I'll be honest. Yeah. But yeah, what yeah. what can you expect? What is unique about Serbian food or a niche? Is there any like yes, Serbian, Serbian food is great as a whole, but niche in particular is quite famous in the region for traditional Serbian food. A lot of Bulgarians, Macedonians, people from the region always come to niche for the food. So it's very famous for its cuisine. Personally, I think it's one of the best parts of the city. I just think like the salads are always so fresh. The meat is just super well cooked, the cheese. Uh, in fact, at the welcome party, we're going to be having a local here explain to the people a bit about Serbian cuisine, what you can expect and how to order and stuff. Me personally, I think a true Serbian, you don't even look at the menu, you talk to the waiter, you just say, hey, what's good today? What have you got? You know, what kind of cheese do you have? What do you got for bread? What do you have for meat? You know, talk to them and they'll give you their local specialities. So a, a traditional restaurant in Serbia is called a kafana. And um, that's where you'll hear the traditional music. That's where the parties are if you're into the kafana music, which I love personally. I'll be going to one tonight, actually. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the food's amazing. So all of this stuff we want to, when the people come, we'll be presenting all of that in the best light to show them, to guide them through the city. What's what's like a typical breakfast in Serbia? Typical breakfast. Oh my God. You have like, it's not too different from actually, no, you know what, you know what the main breakfast food we have is a burek. You have, you, did you have a burek when you were in uh, Belgrade? Maybe. I think I did have one burek, but can you tell everybody what that is? <laughs> what is a burek? <laughs> Burek is like a pastry with either meat or cheese in it. Actually, we're going to be offending people in the comment because I think burek is seen differently in Bosnia. So we don't want to be getting into, you know, regional conflicts. But here, That's burek where had like... it, by the way, it was in Bosnia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so burek is like a pastry with like cheese or meat inside of it. And you'll have that with yogurt. In Serbia, yogurt is a bit more runny. It's not quite like Greek yogurt. It's a different kind of yogurt. So you'll have your burek with your yogurt. That's a must have. The Anton Bakery in Niche is the bakery for burek. We'll probably, we'll be telling everyone to go to Anton. So you know where to go for your burek. <laughs> you'll know where to go for dinner. You'll know, you'll know where to go to co-work. It's like, you'll know where to go, basically. How about the coffee scene? Because I will tell you, when I went to Belgrade first morning, fantastic specialty coffee place. I was really Great. impressed. And I know Great. nomads love their coffee. So what can That's... they expect in niche? <laughs> well, coffee, I mean, I'll tell you one thing. Traditional coffee here is a Turkish coffee. So I don't know if you had a chance to have that. It's a different kind of coffee. I that, did not. Uh, I don't think That's... I'm a fan. I tried it in Turkey a few times. Yeah. Like... Yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, Tur well, Serbia was uh, occupied by Turkey for about 500 years. So a lot of Turkish culture is still within Serbian culture. That's why we have Turkish coffee and some of the food is kind of similar as well. Um, yeah, I mean, coffee, you can, there are a lot of great coffee shops. So you can have modern coffee, like you said, and you can also have the domacha coffee, which is the traditional, the Turkish coffee. Hey, that's good to know. 
Uh, is there anything else that you would like to make sure people know about what they can expect from this weekend? And why should they just check out Serbia in general? What is so special about Serbia? Well, I think one thing uh, that's special, I mean, is, well, we're not in Schengen. So if you're looking to get out of your Schengen days, that's one thing that uh, is offered to you by coming to Serbia. I think Serbians are quite warm people, especially here in the south, south of Serbia. I think people are quite, they take pride in hospitality. So I think they'll be very keen to host people. Uh, like, I feel like the, the people that we're partnering with here really look at the nomads as our guests to the city. You know, they're not just, you know, attending the conference. They're like our guests in a way. Um, so they take a lot of pride in that. I think that's a beautiful thing. I think Niche as well is, it's not a touristy place. So it's kind of quite interesting and fascinating to have all these internationals coming to the city during this event. I think there's a, there is a lot of interest from the locals here. They're very excited about this event. I can feel a lot of energy building <laughs> day by day. The more I talk about this, people are like, yeah, oh yeah, man, I'm going. It sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I just think, what can you expect? Why should you come? I think, I think it's a unique event because you'll be able to connect with all of the people that you need to, to live comfortably as a nomad in the city. All of the co-workings will be guiding you through the city, but you'll also be connecting with our local entrepreneurs, our local IT companies, you know, our local web design agencies, marketing agencies. They'll all be there. They're very interested in meeting these digital nomads and talking to them. So you'll very quickly integrate into the city. There's going to be no nomad bubble. I feel like a lot of digital nomad events, we're kind of in a little bubble. We're having a great time. And we're like, you know, but what's, what's it really like out there for the locals? You know, whereas this is the bubble's gone, you know, we're all one. It's a full integration. So it's um, yeah, I think that's, that's the one of the unique selling points of the event. I am so glad to hear that because you're right. That is often a problem when you go yeah, to these yeah. conferences. Okay. No, this is not, totally different. I'm glad. I'm very, very happy. And it, it sounds really unique, like you said. Um, I haven't even heard of this city until you, until you mentioned it. So I'm sure a lot of people the are the Somebody same. Put it put on, on the map. So this is a, a related question. I'm curious when you get there, what is the public transportation scene like? should I rent a car from Belgrade and have my own car and drive in? Because I have no idea what niche has in that respect, how far things are yeah. apart. Yeah. Well, actually the, um, the airport itself, if you fly to the airport, we have, they'll be picking up our guests. So they're very excited. So they'll be helping us bring guests from the airport to their accommodation. So they'll be organizing that, which is really, really cool. Get a little VIP treatment there. Um, taxis in niche are very affordable. So you can catch buses, you can just pay cash on the buses, but I would recommend a taxi. It's a small city. You're never going to be needing to drive more than 10 minutes. A 10 minute drive is going to cost you about four euros. So especially if there's a few of you, I mean, it's, it doesn't even make sense to catch the bus. We're actually going to partner with a local taxi agency so that when you call them, they'll be answering English. They won't say, Dobre dan. they'll say, hey, how are you? <laughs> they'll say, where do you need to go? So, yeah, there's no Uber in this city. Um, taxi drivers in this city. It's quite interesting in Belgrade. If you get off at the airport and you catch a taxi, I mean, you're playing, you're, you're dancing with the devil. That man is very, you know, you're dancing with the devils. <laughs> that guy is not going to be an honest man to you, unfortunately. But in Niche, it's actually one of the few cities in the entire world where I can honestly say if you get off the airport and there's a guy waiting, a taxi driver waiting for you, like a random taxi driver, that's actually a good deal. He's going to give you the best price and he's going to treat you with respect. Taxi drivers here, I don't understand why they're so respectful and so amazing. But if you catch a taxi in Niche, they don't turn the number on until they leave the street that they picked you up from. So they don't see the street that you're on as the starting point. It's only when they make a turn, I'm like, wow, that is incredible. So I'm very, I very much recommend catching taxis. It's a small city. If you're staying in the center, everything is, is very much walking distance, it's a very walkable city. 
Okay. Is there a language barrier with the taxi drivers? Are we going to need to kind of plan in advance for that? Or is it going to be tricky? So like, I said, we'll, like I said, we'll have one direct taxi company that we'll be uh, partnering with for the event that people can use so that they'll, they won't have that language barrier. But in general, in fact, in Serbia, the English is quite good. Uh, most people speak decent English. A lot of people, especially in the professional world in IT marketing, all the especially the types of people that will be coming to the conference speak very, very strong English. In Serbia, uh, if you watch movies and stuff on TV, they never dub. It's always subtitles. So a lot of people grow up really comfortably in the English language. So you'll be able to connect with locals very easily. Fantastic. One other thing I want to point out, and I learned this uh, the hard way when I got to the Balkans, Serbia and many of the countries in the Balkans seem very cash focused. There were a lot of places yeah. where yeah. I needed cash. Yeah. I was like, oh, credit card. You know, I'm American. So it was like credit card everywhere. And they were yeah. not taking it in a lot of places. So definitely yeah. either get your local currency before you get there or yeah. have this like ATM card or something that's going to help you yeah. get your cash at the yeah. airport, I guess you would say. Yeah, there are ATMs, an ATM at the airport. There are ATMs all around the city. Um, you can take out cash that way. There are a lot of uh, money exchanges called Mignachnitsas. There's a lot of money exchanges in niche. So if you bring them euros or American dollars, they'll exchange them for Serbian dinars. That's our currency, Serbian dinars. Um, but yeah, you definitely need cash. I mean, the if you're at like an upscale, nice restaurant or whatever, they will take card most of the time. But uh, if you're, you know, buying something on the side of the street or whatever, that you're going to need cash. You know, if you're at a, a small cafe or something, sometimes you'll need cash. So I, I always carry around 50 euros worth of dinars with me just to always have cash just in case. Right. Yeah. I, it's something I noticed about the Balkans in particular, but also coming from where I live in Western Europe uh, and the sure, U.S., sure. Yeah, Australia is all hard as well. That like I never had cash, but here you need cash is king, you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, Milan, thank you so much for sharing about this event. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we go, including where people can follow you or find out more about this yes. event? That's a very good, very good answer. Well, you can sign up on Niche if you go to serbianomadfest.com. That will redirect you to the Niche Nomad Weekend. That's an easier one to remember, serbianomadfest.com. We also have an Instagram page for the Niche Nomad Weekend. So Niche is N-I, Sh. There's a Serbian letter called a Sh, which is like an S-H, you could say. So Niche is N-I, Sh, Niche. But uh, sometimes we just spell it N-I-S. So the Niche Nomad Weekend, if you look up on Instagram, you can find that. And uh, I'm Milan Milutinovic, very difficult name, but uh, you can find me on Instagram as well. And uh, I look forward to meeting you. And uh, if you come and you heard about this from the podcast, please let me know. Be very curious to meet people that are listening in. Uh, and we really hope people listening and watching get excited about Niche and check it out. You don't have too much more time before this weekend starts, but hey, especially if you're in Europe, quick ticket over to Belgrade. Done, done. Yeah, if Niche has an airport as well. So, I mean, if you're coming from Vienna, always has very cheap flights direct from Vienna to Niche. If you're in Malta, if you're in Istanbul, if you're in Cologne, Germany, there's a lot of flights. Fantastic. So, would you recommend yeah. flying into Niche and not Belgrade then? Well, you get the VIP pickup if you come through the airport. So, I do recommend it actually. Through the Niche airport, right? For the niche airport, yeah. If you okay. go to Belgrade, you can catch a bus down as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Milan, for sharing this. And, and congratulations for organizing it, uh, the first of its kind. So I hope thank you have you. a wonderful Niche Nomad weekend. We will. Thank you very much, Becca. Appreciate it. Thank you.